This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you. Let me hesitate to, let me hasten to remind everybody that my one contact with Carl Rahn was when he came to Heathrow six weeks before he died. <laughs> I did shake his hand. I didn't have much German. I just said, Ich studiere Christian doctrine for the <laughs> and that was the end of our beautiful relationship. <laughs> I want to begin by showing you two pairs of images. First two are tombs. That modest little monument in the Gesù in Rome, to which Jesuits feel they ought to be devoted. Ignatius's tasteless tomb. <laughs> and this, perhaps slightly less well known, a rather crude tombstone carved during the Civil War in York as a battle was about to commence. It's a tombstone for Mary Ward, a woman from recusant circles who was inspired to found the Martres Societatis Jesu. The project failed, at least in the 17th century. We have a visual aid over there for how it hasn't failed. <laughs> <laughs> but her sisters, having found an Anglican parson honest enough to be bribed, buried her hastily with this crudely carved but very eloquent rhymed epitaph to love the poor sever in the same, live, die, and rise with them was all the aim of Mary Ward. There's a spiritual profundity there, arising from life as a Catholic and from following what Mary Ward called the same of the society, clandestinely and often amid danger. So two 17th century pictures. Now two 20th century ones. <coughs> That's Madrid, 15th, uh, 1931. Republicans sacking the Casa Professor of the society in central Madrid. And there is Heathrow College that we all know and love. In Latin Europe, the relationship between church and state in the 19th century and much of the 20th was tense and often conflictual, sometimes violent. Jesuits kept on getting kicked out of Catholic countries. In the United Kingdom, the Jesuit arrival from the continent in 1794 as refugees may have led to a few kerfuffles with the vicars of apostolic, but frankly, the, the, the secular government basically welcomed them. Jesuit activity in the last two centuries has occurred against the background of a distinctively English blend of secularism and state religion. Catholics may have had their theological problems with this, but their rights to go about their religious business have in general been respected. The acceptance of Heathrow College into the University of London can serve as a kind of symbol for that. Sealed with a royal charter in which the Anglican Queen Supreme Head of the Church of England, can speak of our trusty and well-beloved Terence Corrigan of the Society of Jesus, the then provincial. Living the Jesuit vision, practicing Ignatian ministry, have been rather distinctive enterprises in Britain. It may be obvious enough that British Jesuits are hardly typical examples of the great British public. After all, we were at a concert last night when the rest of the world was watching football. <laughs> but nor are they quite typical examples of the Jesuit. There is a distinctive British take, and it's that latter point I'm going to try to illustrate. How? I'm going to take three statements of British Jesuit stealth understanding from the requisite period, from the Victorian era, and from my own lifetime. If you want the sources, you'll find them on that webpage. 
the historical context and the personalities were very different. But all three illustrate three things. What they say about Jesuit identity is different from what their confrères in mainland Europe were saying. That difference is conditioned by the differences in the political and religious and cultural context between Britain and the continent of Europe. And thirdly, the creativity in question is not immediately apparent, at least to us Brits, because we live with this heritage and therefore we do not understand when it actually changed. The text I want to take from Edmund Campion is well known. His so-called brag, an apologia for his mission to England, which lasted from June 1580 until his cruel death at Tyburn 18 months later. Both he and Robert Parsons wrote documents intended for release only in the event of their capture. But Campion's text was just irresistibly well written and it was released by one of the lay people in his circle. And here I want to highlight just one short passage near the beginning. My charge is of free cost to preach the gospel, to minister the sacraments, to instruct the simple, to reform sinners, to confute errors, in brief to cry alarm spiritual against foul vice and proud ignorance wherewith many of my dear countrymen are abused. I never had mind, and am strictly forbidden by our father that sent me to deal in any respect with matter of state or policy of this realm, as things which appertain not to my vocation and from which I gladly restrain and sequester my thoughts. <coughs> Campion here is making a sharp distinction between his religious aims and matters of politics. He's there to preach the gospel and to minister the sacraments. He is not there to destabilize the Tudor state. How far that actually corresponded to what Jesuits got up to, <laughs> and exactly what Campion said, is a question that I would leave to historians. My concern is simply to point up that Campion is always being forced to develop the Jesuit way of thinking in some quite new ways. He is having to do mission in a country still Christian in which Catholics were becoming a non-conforming minority. And that provokes him into making a very strong statement of the separation of the political from the religious. He cries, when he cries alarm spiritual, he's clear that that doesn't have very much to do with matter of state or policy of this realm. I suggest that the emphasis here represents something new, even if, in retrospect, we can trace continuities with earlier Jesuit tradition. Of course, there's plenty in the Ignatian documents about purity of intention about operating solely for the greater glory of God and for no other aim. But the English situation provokes a new starkness in the distinction. Ignatius himself, for all his detachment, was a courtier and used the skills he had learnt as a young man to further the institutional growth of the early Jesuits. When Ignatius wants one of his companions back from Portugal in 1545, he can write like this to King John III on the board. We humbly petition your highness for God's glory to give him gracious and loving leave to go. His coming here will turn out for the service of his divine majesty and your highness, whose society this is more than ours. It's the king's society more than ours a point only reinforced by Ignatius's uninhibited use of royal formulations, the divine majesty, when he's talking about God. Everard Mercurian, 
the general who received Campion into the society, and, was sent, and who sent him with Parsons and Emerson to England, had been the first non-Spaniard elected general, to some extent as a result of papal pressure. But even here, concerns of politics are kept. In a speech he gave at the congregation which elected him, he does show a sharper sense of Christian and Jesuit commitment relativizing national identity. So another, another quotation on the board. I beg you through the Lord's steadfast love that you should watch out as much as you can for this one thing. In mutual positive regard, you should value each other highly as true brothers. For you are all both fathers and sons of the same vocation. Thus there's no Black Sea, no Spains, no Italy, no Germanys or Frances, but one society, one God in all, all in one Lord Jesus Christ, whose members you are. Here there is a sense of religious identity and political identity being kept separate. But the concern is with the tension in the way that Jesuits relate to each other. It would take the situation in England for the society to be forced to make a distinction between the religious and political significances of Jesuit <coughs> ministry of the ways in which Jesuits would do good in public. The distinction between spiritual and temporal good is of, surely, of course, to be found in the constitutions of the society. But in the ministries of the colleges, as we have heard yesterday, this distinction was actually functioning less and less. By contrast, on the English mission, the only way it can operate is by making that, the only way the mission can operate is if that distinction is made very sharply at the outset. Now, the sharpening strategy has subsequently become very familiar. The United States prides itself on the separation of church and state. Campion's rhetoric mirrors the modus vivendi between Catholicism and the civil life, both of the United Kingdom and of the United States, for the last several generations. One that was sealed notably in the two world wars of the last century, where the significant participation of Catholics was regularly taken as proof of the compatibility between loyalty to country and loyalty to Catholicism. Precisely that assumption, which shapes the upbringing and experience of every cradle Catholic in this room, from Britain, must make it difficult to see that Campion's statement was emerging from a set of problems that in 1580 were new, both for him and for Christians at large. The separation and compatibility of religious and civic commitment is, of course, not an unproblematic doctrine, as the liberation theologians have taught us. But there is no doubt in its influence and its mythological staying power among English-speaking Catholics. And one of the first Jesuit formulations of that doctrine represented something of an innovation in the reception of Ignatian tradition. I now leap effortlessly forward 300 years. <laughs> the second case I want to present is that of Richard Clarke, 1839 to 1900. As a young Anglican cleric in Oxford, he converted to Roman Catholicism at the age of 30 and joined the society two years later. He was for 10 years or so editor of The Month, the society's journal of culture, and in 1896, he became the founding master of what has come to be called Campion Hall. In that same year, 1896, he published an article in a London literary magazine called, at the time, The 19th Century. It became the 19th century beyond and then the 20th century before it folded in 1972. The title of Clark's article was The Training of a Jesuit. And the article is significant because it presents the Jesuit way of life for a general readership, as Clark puts it, for non-Catholics as well as for Catholics. 
Clark is clearly aware of anti joseph <coughs> propaganda and mythology, but he feels able to assume that his reader is an intelligent Protestant, who can only, in the face of this colorful material, be nonplussed. To quote, and not on quote, he cannot but know that the theory that attributes the Jesuits' alleged power in this world to a system of unscrupulous intrigue and deception cannot possibly be maintained. Clark is also not above evoking what he calls the supernatural element in Jesuit success, hands off, <coughs> partly through a strong rhetoric of how much Ignatius wanted his followers <laughs> to be the object of the world's hatred and enmity, partly through apophatic hint. Nevertheless, Clark offers in the main body of his article a reasonably full account of what Jesuit training at this time involved in the English province, from admission to tertiary. He's convinced, he tells us, after 25 years' membership, that such an account can help explain to the reading public who Jesuits are and why they're significant and effective. Just hold that phrase, explain to the reading public. The account itself is a useful historical source, and it can be used quite effectively to highlight what now appear eccentric emphases, in, indeed distortions, in Victorian appropriations of Jesuit formation. The 30 days of spiritual exercises are presented as something of an endurance test. The retreat generally has the effect of sending away from the novice one or two of those whose aim is not sufficiently high, <laughs> or whose powers are too feeble to allow of their understanding the yoke of getting obedience and all the sacrifices it carries with it. Those who've taken a task too difficult for them to accomplish. The yoke of obedience, Clark gives us an anecdote. I once encountered an officer in the army who had been for some time in the novice, and he'd left because he found the obedience required too much for him. I took occasion to ask him how it was that he who had been accustomed to the strict discipline and rigorous obedience demanded of a soldier could not endure the gentler rule to which he was subject as a religious. In the army was his answer, you must do what you're told, but you can relieve your feelings by swearing mentally at your colonel. <laughs> but you cannot do that in the society. That's a pity Father General isn't here. <laughs> it would be wrong, however, if we simply stayed with the obvious datedness and shortcomings of Clark's presentation. This journal of the 19th century is actually rather interesting. It was something of a spin-off from a group called the Metaphysical Society, which met monthly in the 1870s at the Grosvenor Hotel. Both journal and society had the same founder, one James Knowles, with the journal and the society with the, with the journal long outlived and asking the society. <coughs> the Metaphysical Society's membership included 62 of Victorian Britain's leading minds in the realms of theology, philosophy, and science. Around the same table, we find free thinkers, Anglican bishops, and distinguished Roman Catholics, including Cardinal Manning, W.G. Ward, and the Benedictine monk, later Cardinal, Aidan Gaskin. Uh, let me, however, reassure the pious with the thought that Newman was scandalized by, Mark, by Manning's membership and refused to join. <laughs> Um, it's not a very good reproduction, but I thought it was worth just showing it, not least because the first article there is called An Englishman's Protest by His Eminence Cardinal Manning, and the fourth article is called The Creed of the Early Christians by the Very Reverend the Dean of Westminster. There were ecumenical goings on. Though Clark himself would not have moved in London intellectual life until after the Metaphysical Society was dissolved, the magazine for which he wrote his account of Jesuit training continued that society's ideals. It was aiming to promote a free exchange of ideas between different kinds of elite Christian and the world of science. And this at a time when these worlds more generally 
were perceived to be in serious tension. <clears throat> what is significant is not what Clark writes, but the fact that he writes it. The fact that he sees the Jesuit thing as something which can and should be explained to a wider public. And he, is, he actually gives information about which, at the time, Jesuits would probably have been pretty discreet. Now, it's instructive to compare Clark's piece, if perhaps a little of a simple, with a letter written in that same year, 1896, by the then Jesuit general, Luis Martin, entitled, On Some Dangers of Our Times. 46 closely printed pages, clearly influenced by the experience of the Continental Society of Jesus, facing regular persecutions and exiles, and reacting against that experience quite massively, quite negatively. Secular rulers have caused Jesuits all kinds of vexation and persecution. For many of them, tainted and captivated with those principles which are absurdly called liberal, have more than once waged an open and deadly war against her, carried on a pitiless persecution, besmirched her good name, robbed her of her property, driven her forth from their cities as if she were a deadly plague, in a word have left nothing undone to wipe out her name from the memory of men. Martin's disapproval of, Martin's disapproval of 19th century liberalism carries over into his reaction to science. He writes, the cunning enemy of the human race suggests to our young scholastics the necessity of science for the defense of truth and religion. Our scholastics are liable to be assailed by this dangerous temptation. They will wish to depart from our time-honored and approved ratio studiorum so as to be able to free to give the best of their talent and the most precious hours of their time to the modern sciences. Kirka, Clavius, where are you? <laughs> Not surprisingly, Martin argues by insinuation rather than by logic. The flimsy and flashy notions of modern science are to be explained by the general shortcomings of schools and universities. Back to the quote, the effeminate character of home training and the shallowness of general secondary education almost past belief and have become the subject of our daily complaints. He would have found kindred spirits in certain contemporary bloggers. <laughs> the US Jesuit David Schultenova has more generally and rather chillingly documented the tensions between Martin, authority figures in the English province, and the controversial figure of George Turrell. At this time, too, there are similar tensions in Roman relationships with the United States and anxieties over so-called Americanism. The point I want to make here is depends on going beyond the text. Simply to say that the Jesuits of the time, faced with the circumstances of Victorian England, were actually making relationships within the wider culture in ways that were not easily imaginable to their continental counterparts. The content of what Clark and others of his period were saying can easily be scorned today, and perhaps rightly. But, to adapt a rather scandalous statement of Dr. Johnson's, what was important was not that it was done badly, but that it was done at all. <coughs> And in that respect, Clark was pioneering. I'm going to pick up my watch, because otherwise Francesca will start chasing me. <laughs> Before trying to draw threads together, I'd like to suggest that more recent expressions of Ignatian spirituality in the English-speaking world exhibit a similar pattern. Ideas initially developed on continental Europe take on distinctive and quite powerful life as a result of their interaction with some locally peculiar fact features of the United Kingdom. My main example here will be somebody well known to many in this room, <coughs> W. Hughes, the other Jerry. <laughs> 
<laughs> Author of the massively successful God of Surprises. That book is, of course, Ignatian in spirit. But I'm going to talk more directly about an article Jerry published some years before that book, one called Forgotten Truths of the Spiritual Exercises in 1976. The article begins with a series of sharply observed critical anecdotes regarding standard practice in Ignatian retreat giving before the council. Jerry writes, the experience of many in making the exercises may be compared to riding a bicycle which has no chain. <laughs> One may pedal away vigorously at the meditations and additions, but somehow the exercises do not engage with real life. One retreat giver, after exhorting his retreatants to go in spirit with St. Francis Xavier and lick those lepers' wounds, was later heard by one of them complaining loudly at breakfast about the quality of the marmite. <laughs> The article begins very tellingly with six little stories like that. Now, notice, the theoretical work that lay behind the Ignatian renewal in the 1970s and beyond had been done on the continent. Scholarly Jesuits had read source material that had become available in the early decades of the 20th century. They presented their findings as exegetes and they reflected on them as theologians. This Ignatian work, like much else that in retrospect appears as a foreshadowing of the changes associated with Vatican II, was not really a feature of the English-speaking churches at the time. The exception, one that perhaps proves the rule, being the more practically oriented work on church-state relations in the United States, done by people like John Gordon Murray. But there was a preparation for the new approaches to Ignatian spirituality that have now become very familiar to us. It came not from theoretical and academic work as such, but rather from a sense of dislocation, a sense that the assimilation into mainstream British society that had been part of the Jesuit project for well over a century and that was given new impetus by the Welfare State and the Butler Education Act that these lived realities didn't quite fit with the rhetoric of devotion that was coming from Catholic sources. There was a sense of tension building up between a religious rhetoric often couched in negative terms, <coughs> be humble. The hostility to modernity exemplified by Luis Martin continuing to mark Catholic rhetoric. And the lived realities of greater prosperity and assimilation. Many of us here owe considerable upward mobility to education resources given us by our heroic Catholic forefathers. When Vatican II confronted Anglophone churches, those churches were, in terms of ideas, unprepared. Theology wasn't really something we did except to prepare people for priesthood. But the message of Concilia Bajonamento nevertheless found rich soil in an English-speaking world in ways that its continental advocates could not easily have imagined. Thus, in Ignatian circles, the individually guided retreat was taken on far more enthusiastically and almost exclusively than in, say, the Spain, from which the scholarship retrieving the practice had been done. Jerry Hughes's own writings, stressing as they do the ecumenical potential of the exercises, their usefulness among those committed to the pursuit of justice, peace, and disarmament without explicit religious affiliation. And his well thought through connections between Ignatian spirituality and the theories of Friedrich von Hegel all represent ways of thinking that took on a particular shape in response to the society situation of Christianity in these islands. Nothing quite like that was happening on the continent. And to the extent it now has done, they're following our lead, not the other way around. When Jerry, later in the article, directly addresses the difficulty raised in the passage just quoted, he writes this on the wall. The exercises are not a battery charging apparition, but a way of learning how to be self-charging in our ordinary occupations. It is a continuous process. 
which we only assimilate slowly and gradually. Those who do learn it, as Ignatius did, are capable of turning to prayer from the most exacting occupations. The work helps their prayer, and the prayer helps their work. Now, lots of people were saying that on the continent, and Jerry did his theology in Germany. But then Jerry continues in a way that's much more reflective of the British situation. This leads us back to an earlier point. The need for honesty in the exercises, bringing our whole person into them, warts and all. Otherwise, we cannot find God in all things, but only in that ideal image of ourselves, which we bring out at retreat time and put away again on the eighth day. <laughs> honesty, authenticity, coherence. There was, by this stage, a mismatch between an otherworldly spiritual rhetoric and the powerful ministries of education and learning and social betterment in which the English-speaking Catholic churches have been occupied. Those of you who know any history will realize I have been outrageous, generalizing quite outrageously. Uh, it's making one point appropriate for a guest lecture, and of course it needs to be qualified and amplified. The cultural, political, and religious history of Britain was different from that of continental Europe, and it's continental Europe that influences standard accounts of Jesuit self-understanding. Dealing as it was neither with a Catholic state nor with mission territory, but with a Protestant government, the Jesuits and others who followed the Ignatian spiritual tradition developed distinctive styles of functioning and interpretation in ways that were creative and seminal, and perhaps largely unconscious. Often what matters is not what's said, but how it's said, and the context in which it's said. My task has been to talk about the reception of Ignatian spirituality. Reception and spirituality are technical terms tied up with bigger issues regarding central questions in fundamental theology. How a God of absolute truth and love can be involved with creatures all too prone to instability, falsehood, and violence. Inevitably make distinctions between God's goodness and our waywardness. Inevitably then we say, despite all the differences in our responses, there is one spirit in it all that keeps us all together. I don't want to deny the need for that sort of trope or the truth that lies behind it. I simply want to highlight that there are good reasons why we should supplement and even subvert it. Because the religious and the spiritual creativity of the three figures I've highlighted simply does not emerge unless we're prepared to move beyond simple churchy discourse. What made them different, what made them religiously creative, was how they responded to new realities of the world in which they were living. What they said about the exercises of the constitutions directly is not all that interesting. Karl Rahner imagined Ignatius speaking to a modern Jesuit disciple, and he begins by saying, I wanted to say the word of the Belt Gospel just as it has always been said in the church. And yet I thought, and this opinion was true, that I could say what was old in a new way. Something like that is going on among Jesuits working in Britain. There is a tradition about Mary Maud, preserved in the series of paintings of her life in Augsburg in Germany. In one of the canvases, she's kneeling before an image of the Virgin, receiving enlightenment from the heart of God the Father. On the left-hand side, you see crowns, books, and swords in an untidy heap. And the inscription is very eloquent. As Mary was diligently commending the Institute to God, she recognized clearly that its prosperity, progress, and security did not consist in wealth, majesty, and the favor of princes, but in that the members of the same had free access and open path to God. A free access and open path to God independently of the favor of princes. Jesuits in Britain and their admirers and associates like Mary Ward needed to find ways of living corporately out of a vision of that kind rather earlier than their counterparts in mainstream Europe 
and also in some ways rather differently. This brings me on to my second set of conclusions about how we imagine the history of the Jesuit tradition. And connecting our celebration here with the celebration also of the re-establishment of the society in 1814. For better or worse, overviews of Jesuit history understandably prioritize the experience of Latin Europe. The tendency is particularly pronounced in the textbooks we have about the suppression of the society, which typically tell us a story of three monarchies and a craven papacy. Conflicts with Bourbon kings in Portugal, Spain, and France culminate in a weak Franciscan pope having no alternative but to cave in and issue the bull. Obviously, this standard picture is at best incomplete and at worst misleading. <coughs> the problems and the lacunae are now becoming a matter of general recognition among historians. <coughs> we need to recognize, and um, I'm skipping you now. It's beyond my grief to develop that claim in any serious way by looking at the experiences of Jesuits elsewhere notably in the Americas and in Russia. We need to recognize that Jesuit education, as we now experience it, has its roots not so much in the humanist colleges of the old society as in the projects of social betterment and educational betterment carried out by English-speaking Jesuits for immigrant populations in a Protestant culture. Once we recognize the possibility for religious good in constructions of church and state other than that of Catholic monarchy, once, too, we acknowledge that the Jesuit charism is fundamentally not about keeping the church in order, but about mission beyond the frontiers of the Catholic state, then the English experience might need to be highlighted in Jesuit historiography. Perhaps it's not just the eccentricity of an offshore island. Rather, it enshrines turning points that might now appear seminal and generative. For whatever the future of the Society of Jesus and education, ed Ignatian education is to be, in a church that is no longer an export of European Catholic culture, but rather a truly global and pluralist reality. Thank you.